we have this big stone with a, what is now a small sapling then gradually that sapling grows and grows and grows over the perhaps a century and a half and it'll fill that hole and then eventually the aim is hoping that it should split the stone. But, and we're fairly sure that that will work because the masons say the traditional way it was you drill a hole, put oak pegs in and then you water them and that would split the stone. It's a bit like an Arthurian legend or something somehow that I always think of the sword and the stone, you know, somehow I think I related the two. The sculpture at Marchmont divides into two sections. There's the, the finished sculpture, uh, which is complete when assembled, and then there's the sculpture which will never be complete. So there's quite an important distinction. An example of one that is um, complete is Dancing Tree, which is cast in iron, this tree which is cut down its length and then cast into section. And that is that is the conversation is between the industrial and the and the and the actual. So that is a permanent piece. It does relate to trees, which gives it the link to the other type, the the sculpture, which which is ongoing because they're living pieces, and and the trees are, are actually active. And, and and the aim is to make something happen with an object and with the tree. I tend to not worry too much about what a piece means because I quite like to leave that to the observer. It feels right to me. I don't reflect on why it says something to me. It, it, it just does and it seems right and that's, that's how I judge things. In fact, I'm very careful about not giving too much in the title so that I, it allows the viewer, you know, they have a conversation with that piece. I, I prefer to leave it like that. If it becomes iconographic, it is more luck than judgment. Perhaps the sky boat goes nearest that. I don't think you can aim to be iconic. I think, you, I think you, all you can do is hope to be iconic. It doesn't pay to think. A bit like hand and eye with a drawing, you, you leave the hand and the eye to do the business and, and you leave the brain out of it. So the drawing was where perhaps the most excitement was of the idea that came about, you know, stone and the tree. I know the feeling when it's finished, it won't be success, it'll be relief. That's assuming it works. It's a build up attention into this point, you know, and uh, fundamentally I'm responsible for it. So, um, which is uh, kind of scary, really. At this point, we're going to put these 20 ton, eight meter long round slings under the top side of the boulder. We're going to put them such that we have a, a loop sitting halfway up the stone on this side and a loop sitting halfway up the stone on that side. And we'll be able to then lift the stone vertical. Once we've got that done, we'll know exactly where we want the topsoil to go and we'll tip the topsoil so that the stone, when we lift it, comes over and subsides into the topsoil rather than rocking hard and shocking the boom and, and that sort of thing. People like Marcus or, or like Willie Rogers or like Hugo, they're rare people actually, those who, who, who are willing to take these risks. They think it's going to be worth it and it and it's going to be something that is really interesting and, and, and for this one we might not know until all of us are dead anyway. Uh, to get a rock like this a marchment you need a lot of positivity, you need crane driver, lorry driver, a quarry team all with a sort of can-do attitude. When you're offered the opportunity to do something like this you, you take the challenge because um, it feels great to achieve it. <laughs> it's a, it's it's an idiotic project and um, idiocy and, and art go together quite often, I think. You've also got to have an, another idiot who, who's willing to sort of say, yeah, let's do it. So really, I mean, the, there's everybody involved is, is in that same frame of mind. They're going to take quite a lot of risks. It's the interesting is seeing is why people do that. And I suppose why they do it is because it's something they haven't seen before and they're happy to be part of it. The, the question of what is it 
You could just say, well, it's a lump of stone with a tree through it. That's another risk, doesn't the idea of it come across when it's in place? Well, it's tall, it's four and a half metres, so, I mean, it's not tall for a tree, but it's quite a tall sapling, and we bought it in deliberately at that size so that about one and a half metres of it can stick above the stone, because otherwise, if it was all in the hole, you know, we might kill it off. We planted in just over a year ago, so it's settled in well, it's growing well, so hopefully slipping the stone over it won't disturb it too much. That's the hope. This is where you just come into the unknown territory. We don't know. Is all, perhaps all art is legacy in some ways. As time progresses, we have a different view of what, what, why this thing has been made. The value is not, it's not my value. Others have got to be excited by it too. And, that, and you don't know when you're making something whether that's actually going to be the case. In, in the future, I suppose we'll know. It depends how long, how it sort of rests with other people, how they feel about what I've done. The difference with my pieces are that they won't be completed until long after I'm dead. And yet, in some ways, there isn't an end point. The tree creeps growing, so, so you know, it's, it'll be out of my hands fairly soon, in a few years. <laughs>